Time is a flat circle, and everything old is new again. With the enduring popularity of the Metroidvania subgenre, every new side-scrolling adventure game has to find some way to set itself apart, whether it's with new mechanics or an appeal to our own childlike sense of wonder. Remember when the world was an open path to adventure and anything was possible? Me neither. Which is a regrettable realization, and it's also why I'm eager to remind myself with the gorgeous looking trip into the woods when I complete the definitive edition of Ori and the Blind Forest. Here comes a new challenger! Yeah! Hey everyone, and welcome back to The Completionist, where we don't just beat the games, we complete them. This video is brought to you by Patreon. Head on to patreon.com slash The Completionist for exclusive content like our brand new tabletop game show, Board Boys. This month, we play Betrayal at House on the Hill, and things are all haunted and scary all over the place. So, sign up at patreon.com slash The Completionist to join the fun today. Since it first came out, Ori and the Blind Forest has been a game I've been interested in playing. I've heard that it's reasonably hard, with some pretty brutal achievements, but I also know it's supposed to have an incredible story, and the art style is just gorgeous. Even just looking at stills from the game feels like wandering into a vivid world of possibilities. So I'm nervous, but excited, just like at the start of any journey worth taking. We all remember the movies and games we played as a kid that made the world feel bigger and more magical. And that's the sort of experience you can tell they were going for with Ori in the Blind Forest. Even the story of Ori's development is fantastical. This is the first game by Moon Studios, a collective without a set location. Instead, they're scattered all over the world, collaborating from great distances. That's wild and kind of inspiring. They spent four years working on the game and cite classic works of animation like The Iron Giant and The Lion King as major influences. Those influences are apparent from the moment Ori's story begins, with a beautiful intro sequence that feels both fresh and familiar. We start with Ori dropping to the forest floor, a guardian spirit somehow cast down from the massive spirit tree held at the center of the forest but he's quickly found and adopted by a kindly and adorable creature who I can only describe as some sort of gorilla penguin. Through montage, we see Naru and Ori become a family and build a home together until one day a deadly sickness strikes the spirit tree, causing the forest to wither and die. And since it wouldn't be an adventure story without the death of a parental figure, Naru dies of starvation, leaving Ori to set off into the woods to restore them to their former glory. But Ori quickly gains the companionship of a strange ball of light named Sen, who does all the heavy lifting when it comes to combat in Ori in the Blind Forest, shooting out spirit flames with the press of a button. And while Sen handles offense, it's up to Ori to navigate his way through the corrupted woods quickly and nimbly dashes, wall climbs, and triple jumps, which is good because Ori's world is not without threats, just like completing it is unlikely to be without threats to my sanity. Ori in the Blind Forest is a whimsical and gorgeous adventure for sure, but that doesn't mean it's just a walk through the woods. On top of various secret areas and collectible energy orbs hidden all over the place, Ori wants you to experience its quest in a wide variety of increasingly demanding ways. There's your initial run to gather up all the collectibles, a speed run in under three hours, a run where I'm not allowed to upgrade any of my abilities, and of course, a run where I'm not even allowed to die a single time. I'm fairly confident I'm gonna be immersed in this game with the first time playthrough though. Yet the real question is, how am I going to feel by the end? Will Ori's world maintain its beauty and wonder when I'm desperately trying to avoid dying even once? Or will I be so focused that it ends up feeling like just another in the endless parade of Metroidvanias that I've played? If I'm not careful, it could end up being almost as tough to complete this game as it is to make it through the Iron Giant without crying. Okay, fine, maybe not that tough. It's just that that big old robot was just so brave, and if he can be brave, then so can I.
Ori in the Blind Forest borrows from the video games and movies of the past to create something better than empty nostalgia. Instead, it aims for a genuine sense of childlike wonder. The reason that most nostalgia even exists is because we all remember the way certain pieces of art made us feel when we were kids. They blew the world wide open and kicked our tiny kid brains into overdrive. Everyone has those formative art experiences, and it's one of the reasons that Pixar has been so successful as a studio, because they're able to take that feeling and bring it to both kids and adults. It would be fair to say that Ori in the Blind Forest has those same sensibilities, but with the healthy love of old school games mixed in as well. If you grew up playing Metroid and Castlevania games, Ori will definitely scratch that itch at the back of your brain, while simultaneously dragging you back to how you felt when the Iron Giant made you sob on the couch for two hours straight. I just loved that guy so much. You know, now that I think about it, the opening of Ori in the Blind Forest made me think even more about those brutal first 10 minutes of the movie Up, which uses a quick trip through the past to lend weight to the present. Watching Ori and Naru's parent-child relationship develop, even just for a couple of minutes, created a real sense of investment by giving the characters a history that meant something. Even the setting of Nibel Woods carries the burden of its once vibrant past. The spooky forest that Ori finds himself adrift in constantly reminds you of how beautiful it once was, with an intricate but hand-drawn vibe that made me go, oh, more than once. On my first playthrough of Ori in the Blind Forest, I was mostly focused on experiencing the story. It seemed like the right thing to do at the time to let myself explore and breathe so I could appreciate the characters and imagery without a time constraint or the pressure of not dying. But that's when I also made a point of finding all the secret areas and gathering all the energy cells, life cells, and ability cells. Some of them are hidden pretty well, but the world was so gorgeous I honestly didn't mind exploring until I had found them all, which also knocked out a decent chunk of the achievement list off my to-do list. This is also when I did the combat achievements, which were actually kind of fun. Blowing up a certain number of enemies without ever touching the ground feels cool. And it was all part of playing around in Ori's wildly vibrant sandbox. And while I have played a thousand games with the same basic structure as this one, that familiarity ended up sucking me into Ori's world rather than pulling me out of it. Obviously, I'm going to unlock new skills that will open up new parts of the map and encounter old enemies with the benefit of new abilities. Of course, I have to restore three elements to the forest by venturing through a series of dungeon-like areas. I've been doing all of this since I was a kid, but Ori felt fresh specifically because it was able to tap into that feeling through more than just familiarity. It dropped me into its world just like Ori. And just like Ori's relationship with his adorable gorilla mom, it made me care. The key to any good story is relationships. The way the characters feel about each other and bounce off one another is crucial to the deceptively simple storytelling in Ori in the Blind Forest, and even reflects the unusual way that it was developed by a team spread out all over the world. Now to really dig into what Ori in the Blind Forest is going for, and the way that completing it brought me back to the films and games of my childhood, I want to go character by character. Let's start with Ori himself, who is, first and foremost, freaking adorable. Adorable. Look at that little face! Ori is a guardian spirit that fell from a tree, and the game wisely wastes no time getting into the mechanics of what exactly these spirits are. But the exact rules of Ori's world matter less than how Ori feels, which is lost and alone. That's where Sen comes in, just a floating orb of light. Sen acts as a guide and companion to Ori, but it's also much more than that. They are literally a part of each other, with their relationship reflected in the gameplay. Sen's energy blasts are crucial to keeping Ori safe, while Ori moves them both through the world with a nimbleness that we humans can only dream of. Bouncing around and dashing through the air as Ori feels great from a gameplay standpoint, but it also reflects Ori's unsettled place in the world after the death 
of Naru. Lots of kids' movies start with the death of a parental figure in order to force the main character out into the big scary world. It's no coincidence that Naru is big and heavy, where Ori is small and light. Naru's grounded and in control, and her death sends Ori bouncing and climbing off into the woods. But Ori's relationship with Naru is more than just giving them someone to grieve for. The definitive edition even adds a whole area dedicated to Naru's backstory. The game understands that we carry with us the weight of all of our relationships, which brings me to our villain, the big old shadow owl named Kuro. While misunderstood villains are a staple of adventure stories, Kuro rides the line between being sympathetic and truly terrifying. As the game goes on, her backstory gets revealed through flashbacks, and it's really, really sad. I don't want to spoil it here, but like, guys, it's sad. But that sadness does not stop Kuro from feeling like a genuine threat. There are even some brief stealth-like sections where Kuro will swoop in and kill you if you even enter her line of sight. She really, really hates Ori for reasons that become clearer and clearer as the game goes on. And it's a nice reminder that even people in your life who think of you as enemies have their own stuff going on. The game also makes that point with Gumo, the spindly little spider person who was a nuisance early on, but turns out to to just be the lonely last survivor of his people. Once Ori's nice to him, he does a total 180 because he was never that bad of a spider guy to begin with. Ori in the Blind Forest, just like the best adventure stories, has some real tension and sadness, but it's also super wholesome at heart, with a design sensibility that hints at the underlying good beneath the spookiness. The Forest of Nibel is rotting, but beneath that is an environment just waiting to bloom again. Naru is a large, intimidating creature who is kind and nurturing. Gumo's a creepy spider boy who really just needs a friend. Even the music fluctuates between danger and wonder. See, this cuts both ways though. The elements of warmth, water, and wind are necessary for life and must be restored to the forest, but can also bring danger and death. Each one initiates an escape sequence, and those sequences are some of the most hard parts of the game. Water, wind, and warmth all sound super comforting, but that's not the case when they're rushing up at you from the bottom of the screen. Bringing balance to the world isn't without risk, but it's gotta be done. All the best adventure tales have lessons like this though. For example, it's okay to feel sad sometimes, or any one of us can be Spider-Man. And while be nice to people and the environment isn't exactly mind-blowing, the design and characters in Ori's world manage to deliver that lesson in a strikingly visual way. Ori in the Blind Forest is a game about our past and how the relationships we've made with the world around us and the people in our lives stay with us and shape the people that we become. And you know, it got me thinking about my friends and all the people I've brought with me on my adventure to complete as many games as possible. Hey guys, I just want to let you know that I really appreciate all the hard work you've been doing. Thank you. It felt good to let my friends know how much my relationships with them mean to me, and that I can find common ground with even my worst enemies, like Ted. Wait, what? Okay, so I know what you're thinking. Sure, you thought Ori in the Blind Forest was a magical journey, or whatever, but was it still magical the third time or when trying to complete it under three hours? And you know what? It mostly was. A lot of indie games that get praised for being gorgeous or inspirational or whatever are more experiential. Take something like Journey, for instance. But Ori in the Blind Forest is very much a game, and it's not above kicking your ass. Even on hard though, I was mostly able to maintain my sense of wonder throughout that first playthrough. I think it's pretty clear by now that I really enjoyed this game's story, so on my first playthrough, a lot of my focus was on letting myself get taken along for the ride. This is when I also explored and found all the secret areas, but it was a bit more leisurely. I wanted to enjoy my time with Ori in the Blind Forest before my relationship to it started to become contentious. Which brings me to my next playthrough, my speed run. I decided to do this at the same time as my upgrade free run because I'm a glutton for punishment. And also tacos. 
items, but mostly punishment. This time, I was already familiar with the twists and turns of the story, and focused on dashing and blasting my way through in less than three hours, which is hard when your attacks do the minimal amount of damage because you're not allowed to upgrade your dang spirit blasts. So this wasn't necessarily a magical or emotional experience, but it was at least a quick one, and didn't have to try it again which knocked out a few of my most dreaded achievements off that list. Of course, that still left one major achievement, and that achievement was the thing I was worried would kill my love for this game. One Life Mode. While the original version of Oring the Blind Forest had an achievement for getting through the game without dying, the Definitive Edition goes one step further and adds it as an official difficulty level. And this one? This one was pretty damn hard. There's a lot of stuff in this game that can kill you quickly, and one life mode ended up taking me more tries than I'm proud of. Sometimes it was the escape sequences, sometimes it was random enemies, and sometimes I just got careless and like walked into some dumb spikes. We've all been there. During these attempts, there was no storytelling magic to be had. It was all focus and determination. Who's got time to be moved emotionally when there's completion on the line? It made me glad that I had taken my time on that first playthrough though, because Ori's world deserves it. But this time, this time, it was war. But unlike most wars, this one had a satisfying ending, when I finally made it through without dying. And you know what? It felt great. It was a totally different experience than my other playthroughs, but it wasn't a totally unrewarding one. Ori in the Blind Forest is rich in emotional rewards, but light on material ones. There's a leaderboard where you can compare your speedruns to those of other people, but that's about it. And honestly though, that's fine because it's about the journey, man, not the destination. And it was quite a journey. On my first playthrough through the game on hard mode, I found all 12 health cells and 15 energy cells, the eight map stones, 45 secret areas, I unlocked all 28 skills in the ability tree and managed to only tear up one time. On my second playthrough for the speedrun purposes, I did way less than that, but on purpose, so leave me alone. There were no skills unlocked, no secrets found, and no times that I teared up but I did do all of this in under three hours, so there's that. And then finally, there was one life mode, with one life, 12 screams of frustration, and more attempts than I'm willing to admit. But when I finally did it, I was so proud of myself that I yelled, screw you and your blind ass forest. So there's that, you know? So there you have it. Orient the blind forest is harder to complete than I expected but it's also a beautiful story with an exquisitely designed world, adorable and compelling characters, and consistently solid gameplay. It took me back to my childhood, when the world was full of adventure, just waiting for me and my friends to explore it. You know, I think it still can be. I've been stuck here in front of this wall of video games for a long time, but no more. There's a whole world out there. Come with me, let's go. <sighs> Boys, what's going on? An adventure. <gasps> Brett, even Ted, let's go outside. We're going on an adventure. <sighs> so, with that in mind, guys, we give this game our completionist rating of Complete it! That's all the time we have for today, guys. So please, as always, let me know what you thought of today's episode somewhere on the internet. If you like the show, do me a favor, hit the like button, subscribe, leave a comment down below. Let me know what games you want to see in the future of the show. Big shout outs to all of our folks on Patreon. And hey, speaking of Patreon, you can join us there at patreon.com slash completionist for all new exclusive content. And if you missed last week's video on Smash Bros, give that a click or tap right here. I've been Gerard, and we'll see you next week for another brand new episode. Bye.